Good afternoon. Today we'll be talking uh, about position sensors. Um, so last week we have covered the resistive sensors, inductive and capacitive, and today uh, we'll cover the remaining basic principles. And uh, we'll also be talking about proximity sensors, which you will see are quite different from all the others. Uh, but for the moment we'll stick with continuous sensors. And this is uh, the microwave or radar position sensor. Uh, it is a sensor for position, it is a sensor for speed, and uh, it can be used uh, quite often as uh, a liquid level sensor as well. So we'll see again uh, a similar picture uh, in a few weeks. Uh, a microwave sensor is based on uh, the measurement of uh, reflections from an object. So uh, you have a transmitter, uh, you have a receiver and you are looking for the echo that you receive from some liquid level or from some object that you have anywhere. Uh, there are basically two principles that are used. One is the measurement based on the time of flight. Uh, this is used especially for longer distances. You will see why in, in a few seconds. And uh, the second principle is called frequency modulated continuous wave. And this is on used uh, for shorter distances. Uh, in both cases, uh, you have a transmitter that is transmitting either a pulse or a continuous wave. Uh, and uh, you have an object that is reflecting this wave and you are looking for the echo. Uh, this means that the object needs to reflect the radio signal in a good way. And uh, it means that you need also to select a suitable frequency range where the echo will be the best. Uh, the time of flight method works on a, a very simple principle. You send a signal, you send a radio pulse, uh, let's say at time T0, and uh, this signal gets reflected from the object and uh, you are looking for the time difference between uh, the time you send the pulse and between the time you receive the pulse. Uh, the radio signal is uh, traveling with speed of light, so uh, the time difference will be very small. And for this reason, uh, this time of flight method is uh, suitable for longer distances, let's say larger than a few hundred meters, because uh, otherwise uh, the time difference will be very, very small and would be difficult to measure. Uh, if uh, you want to measure shorter distances, you need to measure short periods of time, and this is quite difficult. And for this reason, we are not measuring the time, but we are looking for frequency difference. This is the principle of the second method, the frequency modulated continuous wave. And the principle is that uh, you are sending a continuous signal and you vary its frequency. So the signal that you transmit from the transmitting antenna looks something like this. So you first have a low frequency, then you are increasing the frequency, and then at some point you need to go back to the original low frequency setting. So here you see this is a transition back to the low frequency. So you are sweeping the transmitting frequency. Uh, if you are receiving the reception from the object. Uh, you have here a transmitter, here is the continuous wave, and the object is somewhere here. So I will receive the echo in a receiver, and uh, this will be the same frequency variation, the same frequency sweep. So uh, I can compare the frequency I'm sending right now with the frequency I'm receiving right now. If you com if you uh, look uh, on the frequency as a function of time, this is how it will look like. So the frequency, the blue line, is the frequency that you are transmitting at some specific instant. The frequency here is the received signal. And there is a delay between the frequency that you have transmitted a while ago and between the moment when you receive the same frequency. And this delay is uh, proportional to distance. 
because if the distance from the sensor to the object will be longer, it will take longer for the signal to travel and to be received back. So there will be a larger frequency difference. So you are overcoming the problem of measurement of small short times uh, in such a way that you are comparing frequencies. This can be done very easily in a, a circuit that's called frequency mixer. And uh, it's basically that you multiply those two signals together and uh, you get the frequency difference. So here uh, the transmitter is running independently on the circuit. You measure what frequency are you currently sending. The, you receive the second signal from the receiver and here in the mixer circuit you compare those two frequencies together and the result is frequency difference. Uh, you demodulate that, so this means that you change this frequency difference into distance and the output is some signal that is saying the object is at this distance. Uh, so this works in quite a good way for small distances, uh, but the limitation is on the larger distance side. So here, if this distance would be too long, it means that you are not able to to distinguish between the reception at this moment and between the reception at this moment, for example. So the range of this kind of sensor is limited. It has a maximal range. And uh, the limitation is uh, caused by the fr frequency sweep that you have in the transmitter. A s very similar principle is used, uh, for example, in laser distance meters. It's using exactly the same approach. So we are not sending a laser pulse and measuring how fast will be it be received, but we are modulating the signal with uh, this frequency modulated continuous wave. So this is uh, valid not for, own, not for radar, but al also for laser distance meters. Uh, the Ranges that uh, you can expect for those kind of radar distance meters are somewhere between, let's say, 300 millimeters for the frequency modulated continuous wave, uh, up to let's one kilometer roughly. Uh, but uh, in industrial systems, it's somewhere like 10 meters. So uh, the principle works for large distances, but industrial sensors for liquid level, they are limited in uh, in smaller range. Uh, the resolution that you can expect is roughly around one millimeter, so it's quite accurate. Uh, it uh, requires um, an object or a, a liquid, if it's a liquid le level sensor, that has um, a significant uh, permittivity. So uh, it cannot measure air, for example, because air is what it is transferring the signal, but you don't get any reflection. Uh, it can be used for conductive and non-conductive liquids or surfaces, so it will work for all objects. Uh, the used frequencies are uh, high frequency signals, so it's uh, somewhere around 10 gigahertz, that's one band, or uh, another band is 24 gigahertz or 26 gigahertz, so it's quite large frequency. Uh, the Radar sensors, they are quite expensive. So, for example, uh, a liquid level sensor with this, uh, with this approach, uh, with, this, with this radar sensor is like 250,000 check rounds, something like rough that, r roughly. So, uh, those applications are uh, limited by, by the cost. And uh, it's, it's suitable for applications where you don't really have another option than uh, to use a radar sensor. Uh, what you see here on those two pictures are industrial radar sensors for liquid level. Uh, so this is the antenna, that's the only part of the sensor that is in direct contact with the tank. Uh, so it can be made from stainless steel, it can be a rod, it can be a cable. And uh, then uh, this is the electronic that handles the signal processing. Uh, here you have the same arrangement, the antenna here and the electronic unit over there. And what you see here on the left, that's uh, a radar speed sensor it's using exactly the same principle. So it's 
sensing how fast you're going in a car, for example. Okay, so uh, that's all for continuous sensors. And uh, now we'll be talking about uh, incremental encoders. And uh, the most common incremental encoder is an optical sensor. It is called incremental, incremental encoder or incremental rotary encoder, in short IRC. Um, this approach, this sensor can be used for linear sensors or can be used as an angular sensor. Uh, I will start with the linear version. Here, here we will see some, some problems. <coughs> and uh, the IRC is uh, very common for CNC machines, for example, uh, where you need to measure very accurately the position. Uh, this is a relative sensor. So when you turn it on, you first need to go to some reference position and uh, you can count the pulses from the reference position. Uh, it is also a digital sensor, so it has, in principle, a limited resolution. But we will see that the resolution is still very high. Uh, a typical resolution of this kind of sensor is somewhere around 5 micrometers. So it can be very accurate as well. So how does it work? Um, we have a tape, and uh, the tape has uh, transparent and opaque fields. Here uh, I have an, an example of such a tape. So uh, this is a, a tape for from an inkjet printer. So uh, almost all inkjet printers are equipped with, with this sensor uh, because it's quite simple to produce and uh, quite accurate. Uh, so this is a this is a tape itself, and we have transparent and black lines. Uh, we need to know the page between the lines, so it has to be defined. And uh, then we need to have a light source and a light detector. So there is a pair of uh, an LED and a photodiode. Uh, one, for example, the LED is from the, the back side of the tape, and uh, it's shining infrared radiation through the tape. Uh, on the other side of the tape, you have uh, this detector. It's typically a photodiode or a phototransistor. And uh, you are looking for transitions between the black and white field. So, for example, in the inkjet printer, uh, the tape is fixed at the frame. And uh, this uh, assembly can move left and right. It's moving together with the printer head. And uh, you're reading the signal if I'm looking on the black field or on the transparent field. So the output uh, that you will see uh, will be a rectangular signal. So for example, uh, it will look like this. We're moving uh, the assembly in one direction. So this is, uh, let's say this is position X, and this is the output uh, from the sensor. So if I start at some reference position, I can count the pulses. I can count the transparent and opaque fields, and I know the pitch, so uh, this is known, that's the, that's the pitch, T, and uh, therefore I know what was the distance. But if you use just one sensor, then uh, you start from some position, and by looking on one signal, you're not able to tell if you're moving left or right. So for this reason, we have a second sensor here, and this sensor is shifted typically by one quarter of the pitch. It doesn't really matter if it's one quarter or one half or whatever, but uh, it, it's shifted. So the signal that we will see will be also a rectangular signal. It will have the same shape, but will be phase shifted. If you look here on my picture, so let's say I'm moving uh, to the right, so this sensor sees this black field first, and then this sensor sees the black field. So there will be a phase shift between the signal. And uh, if I look here, let's call this signal A, and this is signal B from the second sensor, uh, we will have a phase shift, let's say, like this. So 
Uh, by looking on the second signal, I can tell, okay, now it's moving in, in some direction. So let's say um, the logic 1 corresponds to the black field and uh, logic 0 here corresponds to the white field. So for example, here if I say this is sensor A, this is sensor B, uh, the black field is logic 1, so I will see logic 1 first and then I will see logic 1 from the signal. So this means that in my case, as I have drawn it, I'm moving to the left. Because here I first have, uh, if I say a disposition, I first see this signal and then I see this signal. If I move in the other direction, the signal B will be phase shifted as well, but will be shifted by one quarter of period in the other direction. So in the case of this movement, it will look like this. So now the approach is quite easy. I look for uh, the signal B when there is a transition on signal A. So for example, here on the rising edge, here I had logic zero, here I have logic one, and I can say, okay, this is moving left and this is moving right. I can do the same here on the falling edge, I had logic 1 here, logic 0. So uh, you, from this sensor you need at least two signals uh, to make it work uh, and uh, it's a limited resolution because you're limited in uh, the pitch here in the resolution that you can produce and uh, it's a digital sensor and it's a relative sensor. So when you turn it on, you don't know where you are. You first need to go to some known position. Typically, the signal from uh, this IRC looks like this. So we have signals A and B, and you have a third signal, a third track here that's called index, and it has only one known position, or you can have m more, more positions that are encoded somehow. So here, when you move the assembly, uh, you first need to look for the index uh, index symbol, and then now we know, okay, this is my known position, and from the known position you can move, uh, and you can count the process. <coughs> so you need the sensor itself, and uh, you need the uh, electronic circuit that will evaluate that. Uh, the typical resolution is uh, somewhere around 5 to 10 micrometers. Uh, this is a linear sensor, so it depends on the correct distance between the transparent and opaque fields. And uh, if you have thermal expansion, then this distance is changing. So you may have trouble with uh, thermal expansion. Uh, those sensors, we, we will see that in, in the lab. Uh, we have already used some of those. Where? Where did we use such a sensor? In, in what uh, lab class? At least in my group, I told you that this is a position sensor. Uh, if you remember the task Optics 2 with the microscope, the microscope was equipped with this kind of sensor, and we are measuring the position of the microscope, uh, and we were able to transfer this into the dimensions of the object. So those were linear sensors with resolution of roughly 5 micrometers. Uh, we'll use them again in about three weeks in the labs uh, where we'll be using this signal A and B to, to measure some position. Um, and I, IRC is uh, also very common as a rotary encoder. So uh, here, if it's a rotary encoder, you eliminate the problem with thermal expansion because uh, the disk where you have those lines is expanding equally in all directions and uh, it will not change the pitch. So uh, more often you will find those uh, rotary encoders. That's also the name incremental rotary encoder. Uh, it works on exactly the same principle. We have some disk uh, with transparent and opaque fields and uh, we are looking if we see through 
the transparent field or if we don't see through the opaque field. Uh, what you see here, those yellow dots represent, for example, four sensors. Um, some some sensors, they have signal A, B, A, A known and B known, so we have more signals to verify the functionality of the program, uh, of the sensor, so typically you have something like four sensors. And uh, here you have an example with an LED source with a mirror. So here this produces light. I'm looking through this rotary mask and uh, the mask has those lines on it. Uh, I have some disk that I can show you. So <coughs> this, is a, this is a disk from an incremental encoder. Uh, the lines are here in this in this gray field. You can uh, look how fine that is. And uh, the typical resolution for the IRC is uh, quite high. So you can easily find sensors that have like 10,000 positions per one revolution. Even more, you can have like 50,000 or 500,000. It depends on what you require. Uh, so here we have some examples of incremental encoders. So they look like this. The the disk is uh, inside, and uh, on the on the outside, um, the sensor looks like this. So uh, here is an incremental encoder. You see the cable. There will be signal A, and signal B, and uh, it's connected to a motor that so that I can measure its position. Uh, but uh, it's a relative sensor. So uh, it can be used only in applications where I can afford to have this initial motion. So for example, uh, if you have a CNC machine with those incremental encoders, and it's not a problem at all, you start the machine, you look for some end switch, some home position, and say, this is my zero position. Uh, in some applications, you require the absolute information. So in this case, you cannot use the IRC, but you have to use an absolute encoder. Uh, an absolute encoder can be created in a similar way, uh, but we will need to modify the code wheel. So uh, here is an example of an absolute rotary encoder. And uh, we'll see two different versions. The one on the left is encoded in binary code. The one on the right is encoded in gray code. Uh, this is just an example of an encoder that has four positions per one revolution. Uh, in reality, we'll see later the, the, the code disk is more complicated. Uh, and um, you see again here we have uh, black and white fields and the yellow dots represent the pair of uh, photodiode and uh, an LED, for example. So again, we are looking th through the transparent field or uh, it's blocked by the opaque field. Uh, what you see here on the left is a, an example when the disk is encoded in a binary code. In both cases, let's say, if uh, I have white and white field, it's 0, 0, so it's binary encoded. Uh, if it's black, then it's 1. Uh, here you see we have two bits, and therefore we have four options how this can be encoded. Uh, in binary code, uh, you are encoding the, the number in, in binary system. So here you have 0, 0, here uh, you have 1, 1, here you would have 1, 0, and so forth. Uh, this, however, has one disadvantage. Uh, you are not able to tell if the signal that you read from the sensor is, uh, is okay. In other words, you don't have any way to verify if uh, the sensor is working correctly. Uh, this can be done in gray encoding, which is shown here on the right side. Uh, the advantage of uh, a gray code is that between each transition, there is only one bit changing at a time. Uh, so, for example, here we see that 
we are changing from 0, 0 to 0, 1. So this bit is changing. Here we're changing uh, only this bit from 0 to 1. And here we're changing this bit from 1 to 1, uh, 1 to 0. So in, if you encode the code wheel in gray code, you know that in all cases there should be just one transition at a time. It's not the case in binary code. In binary code here, there is one bit changing. Here there are two. Here there is one. And from 1, 1 to 0, 0, it's two bits again. So if you encode it in binary code, uh, you don't know if it should be changing by one bit or by two bits. So all the absolute rotary encoders are encoded in gray code. And uh, only one bit is changing at a time. Uh, so the electronics can evaluate quite easily uh, if uh, there is some problem with the sensor because if there is one uh, more than one bit changing at a time, you know there is something wrong because I should have only one transition. Uh, the code wheel in a real encoder is much more complicated. So it looks like this. So this is an example of um, more than, I think it's about 10 or 12 bit uh, encoder. And you see here the, the pattern and the pattern is made in gray code. So uh, you will find only one bit is changing at, at a given time. Here we see more tracks, so here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, roughly. So uh, this encoder uh, would encode 2 to the power of 12, uh, which is 4096 96 positions. So this would be, would be the resolution of uh, this kind of encoder. So uh, the advantage of this absolute encoder is that you have the absolute information about position. You turn the sensor on and you know directly in what position you are. Uh, on the other hand, you have lower resolution compared to the relative sensor. Uh, here you see how the code wheel is complicated, it will be also large, and uh, it is able to encode only, let's say, 4,000 positions. If this would be a relative encoder, uh, you could expect something like uh, 20,000 positions. So uh, the absolute encoder typically has uh, a much lower resolution than a relative IRC. Typically it's about 10 times lower resolution. And uh, also it's more expensive because you need more, sen more sensors, you need here to read at each track needs its own system, uh, it needs own photodiode, own, own lenses and so forth. So uh, the absolute encoder is very good if you really need the absolute information in the application, uh, but uh, it has a limited resolution compared to the IRC. <coughs> I have here some more examples uh, of this kind of sensor. Uh, you can easily create your own IRC as well. So this is uh, a metallic disk uh, that acts like an IRC. You see here we have slots and uh, you, uh, you add uh, a photoelectric sensor from one side and a light source from the other side. So this can be a speed sensor. Uh, it can be a position sensor if you look for this notch and uh, you are able to, to use this as a reference position. So we we'll use a similar sensor on the lab. Uh, you see, uh, so again we have the code wheel here, a metallic disk, and here those are proximity sensors and we'll dis discuss them in a few minutes. Uh, you can find Incremental encoders also uh, in um, home appliances. Uh, so if you look uh, in a mouse, not today, today all mouses are optical mouses, but a little bit older, uh, older versions, then you will find an assembly like this. And uh, this is uh, an optical incremental encoder. So this is a code wheel, 
that you see here in, in true access and uh, here is the pair of uh, phototransistor and uh, an LED infrared and uh, it's m reading the number of pulses from one axis and from the other axis. Uh, let's see if I have something more here. Mm, no, yeah. Those. This is a. Uh, this is an optical sensor that y you could use for uh, the metallic disc uh, as a speed sensor or as a as a position sensor. So uh, one half of it is uh, a light source. The other half is uh, a phototransistor. And you measure. Uh, if uh, the disk is passing, if I see the teeth or if I see the gap, and the output is uh, a rectangular signal, basically. Okay, so now it's all for position sensors with uh, continuous output. And now we'll look on a completely different category, uh, which is proximity sensors. Uh, proximity sensors are sensors that are able to detect if the object is present or if it's not. Uh, in other words, they do not measure the distance, but they just give you information if the object is there or if it's not there. Uh, the output of a proximity sensor is uh, typically a voltage signal and uh, it's a digital signal. So either zero or one, object is there, object is not there. Uh, we will discuss just three ways how this sensor can be built, and it will be an inductive sensor, capacitive sensor, and optical sensor. Uh, proximity sensors are typically used on um, manufacturing lines to detect objects. Uh, you can find them in uh, in traffic applications where you can detect if or how many cars have passed through a crossroad, uh, you can find them in packaging. They are used to detect if the object is placed correctly, and you can pack that pack pack it. For example, uh, proximity sensors are typically less expensive than continuous sensors, but you don't have the information about the distance. Uh, <coughs> the typical ratio between the price of a proximity position sensor and an analog position sensor is roughly 1 to 5. So let's say uh, the resistive sensors that we have seen last week are somewhere around 5,000 check rounds. Uh, the, let's say, capacitive or inductive proximity sensors for roughly the same distance will be something like 1,000. So uh, there is a huge difference in those prices, um, but uh, in many applications it's sufficient to s just s know if the object is there or if it's not. Okay, let's start with the inductive sensor. Uh, the inductive sensor has a sensing element that is a coil, and uh, you are looking for the change of inductivity has this coil, and uh, this change of inductivity is caused by the object itself. So you have a coil that is embedded in the sensor, it's a sensing coil. Uh, this coil produces a magnetic field around it, and uh, if you place an object in this magnetic field, it will change the inductivity. Uh, typically, it is connected with an oscillator. So here, uh, the coil is part of a circuit that produces AC signal. And uh, the frequency and amplitude of these oscillations is a function of uh, the distance between the object. So uh, when you approach the object, you uh, increase the inductivity and uh, you change the frequency. So this is detected in a detector, and then the output of the detector is connected to a flip-flop, because here the output should be a digital signal. So I should be able to uh, set the sensing distance, 
and uh, also the sensitivity. So this is achieved with the flip-flop setting or with the detector setting. So the output here is zero or one, yes or no. The inductive sensor works only for objects that are conductive. So this object has been a condu conductive material and uh, they work in the best way if uh, your object is ferromagnetic. So the best material as the object is iron. Iron is conductive and it's ferromagnetic. So uh, typically the properties of the sensor that you will find in data sheets are defined for iron. The most important information that you need to know is the sensing distance. So it's the distance between the sensor and between the object. <coughs> this sensing distance is quite small. It's a few millimeters. So for example, here you have the data sheet. And for this sensor, they say the sensing distance is one millimeter. So you are able to detect if the object is within the distance of one millimeter. If it's farther, then you will not detect the object. Uh, the sensing distance depends also on the direction from where you approach the sensor. So it's defined from the direction in the axis of the sensor, which is like this. So this is the sensing distance. If you move from the side, like you see here, then the sensing distance will even be smaller. So the inductive proximity sensor is uh, quite sensitive in uh, how do you set the distance. And in all cases, it's quite small. Uh, you can find sensors that will work for, let's say, 10 millimeters. Uh, but uh, the sensing distance also depends on the size of the sensor. So for example, here, you see this sensor has a diameter of 3 millimeters. So it's small and has one millimeter sensing distance. If uh, you have a sensor uh, like that's, for example, li like this one, this would have something like five millimeters, for example. Uh, the sensing distance also depends on the material. So we already know that it sh has to be conductive. Uh, it works the best for iron. Uh, the sensing distance is decreasing for other materials. For example, stainless steel has a small distance. Um, stainless steel can be ferromagnetic or does not have to be ferromagnetic. That depends on the composition of the alloy. But uh, <coughs> in all cases, the distance is a little bit smaller. If you are looking for different materials, brass, bronze, aluminum, copper are not ferromagnetic, <laughs> but they are conductive. And uh, you can detect them with an inductive sensor as well, but uh, the distance is about half of the distance for iron. Uh, typical applications and sensors, so here you see inductive sensors. Um, <coughs> I have some examples here. Um, so, um, this is an inductive sensor, and <coughs> all those, yeah, all those are inductive inductive sensors. Um, they, from the outside, it typically looks like a screw here, so you can install that in the application uh, with the nut here and the nut here. You can set the distance uh, precisely, and. Uh, everything is embedded in the sensor. So uh, the sensor is typically powered uh, with uh, a DC voltage, let's say between five and 30, 30 volts in the industrial systems, and then you have some output uh, in, in as a voltage. Inside of this sensor here, there's the sensing coil, and here you see it's a plastic cap. Uh, this needs to be non ferromagnetic so typically plastic it looks like this uh, from the outside you cannot tell if it's uh, an inductive sensor or if it's a capacitive sensor they look the same way uh, in, in both cases 
Um, typical application, what you see here on, on the, the picture, uh, is uh, as a speed sensor in uh, an ABS system. So uh, on every wheel in a car, you have a disc like this from iron, so ferromagnetic. And uh, this is the inductive sensor, and it's sensing uh, the speed of this disc. So it is uh, able to control the brakes. If one wheel is blocked, then you have a different speed than from the other ones. And uh, it works, it is quite robust because uh, here uh, you see no uh, problem with, uh, with dust or with, with, with uh, whatever you can find in a car. Uh, the output can uh, be of two types. Uh, they are named PNP and NPN, and uh, it depends on what do you need. In uh, a PNP application, the output is connected in this way. You have the load. The load is the input of your system that will process the signal. It can be an LED, it can be a light, whatever you need. Uh, in a PNP system, you have a permanent connection between the minus and you have a s transistor between the plus. So uh, this turns on when you have the object, when you have the signal, and you have current flowing through the load. Uh, in some applications, you need a different behavior, so they then you can have the NPN switching, the transistor sits between the minus wire and between the load, so it's switching the minus pole. Um, more often, uh, I would say, is this uh, PNP, you're switching the, uh, the plus signal. <coughs> now, what you see here <coughs> is the shape of the magnetic field. Here, here you see the coil, and uh, this is the magnetic field that needs to go through uh, the plastic cap. And uh, if you have uh, uh, the uh, metallic cover here, then the magnetic field has a different shape, and <coughs> this will change you the detection distance as well. <coughs> Okay, uh, so now <coughs> so now <coughs> I'm sorry. So let's take a look on capacitive sensors. Uh, they work in a similar way uh, as uh, inductive sensors, but uh, they will be able to detect uh, non-conductive objects as well. <coughs> so the principle is that we have a capacitor. We have two electrodes, and uh, between those electrodes, we have a magnetic, we have an electric field. If I approach an object the electric field will change and this will be detected. So <coughs> the connection is similar to inductive sensor. You have again an oscillator, a detector and a flip-flop. Um, but uh, now the object does not need to be from a conductive material. So a capacitive sensor it can detect also plastic, it can detect wood, it can detect water, for example. Uh, the sensing distance... <coughs> uh, the sensing distance is similar to uh, the inductive sensor. So it's also small, it's few millimeters. Uh, you will find it in data sheets again. It behaves in the same way like for inductive sensors. So it's uh, defined from the sensor to the object, and the detection zone has this shape. So if you're approaching into the detection zone from the side, you will have a different uh, detection distance. As I said, it also depends on the material. 
so uh, it's the highest for metal and water and uh, it's smaller for other materials. So if you want to detect plastic or wood, you can expect that the distance is um, about one half of the specified distance. <coughs> uh, the output uh, is again PNP or NPN and um, you can find also a description that says normally open and normally closed. That's here the NO and or NC signal. And uh, here you have four options how you can connect it. So the NPN is connecting the load it's here uh, between the plus and the minus terminal of the power supply. And here the sensor has both the normally closed and normally open contacts. Uh, not all sensors have this, uh, this uh, connection. Uh, so we can either find a normally open or a normally closed contact. Again, this depends on uh, uh, what do you require. Uh, the output from a capacitive proximity sensor is again a rectangular signal. It can be used as a position sensor, it can be used uh, as uh, uh, a speed sensor. Uh, here you see a typical application, again you have a disc with teeth and uh, you are looking if I see the teeth or if I see the gap. The output will be a rectangular signal like this and when you count the pulses you can uh, get the position. When you uh, measure frequency, you can measure the speed. If you install two sensors, for example, in, in this way, you can get the position uh, and uh, you can distinguish left or right. Uh, capacitive sensors are looking like, like this. So mm, you see on the pictures here, I have <laughs> some examples. Those are all inductive sensors. We we'll use them in the lab and uh, we'll find out for what materials they are working and what is the sensing distance. Now, from the outside, you really cannot tell if it's an inductive or if it's a, a capacitive sensor. Here you see a typical application, uh, a line, you pack products in boxes and uh, you need to detect uh, if the box is in the correct position so that you can pack uh, the, the object inside. So here you see uh, the sensor will sense the box in a correct position and some uh, mechanism will place the, the product inside of, the, of this box. <coughs> okay, and uh, in the end, <coughs> the proximity sensor for, from optics. Um, there are two principles how this can be made. Uh, one is based on uh, reflection from the object. Here we have uh, an object, we have a source of light and a detector. <coughs> <coughs> if you approach the object uh, into the zone where it can sense, uh, you will receive a reflection and you know the object is there. So this is, ba this is based on the reflection on the object. The sensor uh, combines both the transmitter and the receiver. Uh, so uh, such an optical sensor uh, typically looks like this. <coughs> so those are uh, two optical sensors. You see here uh, one part is the transmitter, one part is the receiver and if I approach an object I will get the reflection. Uh, the same is here, uh, one half is re receiver, one half is transmitter. So this requires only one sensor, one, one box. Uh, the, those sensors they work for larger distances, let's say a few meters are doable. Uh, for short distances uh, you uh, can also use uh, two sensors, well, one transmitter and a separate receiver. Uh, so you are basically looking uh, if the 
radiation is blocked or if it's not blocked. So this is used in, in small distances, in speed sensors. Uh, we'll use it in, in the lab as well. Uh, I have here an example, uh, a set of uh, a transmitter and a receiver. So they are installed like this. And if uh, someone will pass, then will block the light and this gets detected. So we can detect, uh, you can detect uh, <coughs> objects, you can detect people uh, with this kind of sensor. Uh, so, a typical application, uh, which you see here again, an object uh, on a conveyor belt, and here you detect, okay, the product is there, I can pack it, or you can measure uh, how long it is, and, and so forth. Some questions? Okay, no questions.